when I ask uh, our two city council members to come over and I think that there is a presentation to be made uh, on behalf of the city to Dr. Carrasco. Dr. Carrasco? Is this my prize? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jose, you, you, you won't get my son, but we do have a little plaque. <laughs> so, uh, first off, our pleasure to be here. Uh, my council colleague uh, and I, and, and my son as well, uh, he may enjoy the mic for a moment. Uh, but we wanted to be able to recognize Jose from the city council and felt that this was a wonderful opportunity this week to be able to do so. So I'm just going to be able to say a little bit about him, and hopefully I don't steal too much of your, your thunder. <laughs> So, Jose Carrasco is a professor and community organizer that trained and consulted organizations and inspired many individuals to engage in civil activity throughout the United States, Central America, and Europe. Some of Jose's lifetime achievements include the foundation of the Council of Churches, spearheading the Chicano movement in the southwest region of the United States, and assisting the National Farm Workers Union, Huelga. He also took part in the development of a faith-based organization, Faith in Action, originally known as People Improving Communities Through Organizing, or PICO. This organization, dedicated to providing immigrants with a path to citizenship, is consistent with a community that celebrates practicing, welcoming the newcomer, and protecting the marginalized. Jose also taught at San Jose State University as a professor of humanities, urban and regional planning and ethnic studies and was also chair of the Mexican-American Graduate Studies and associate dean of the School of Social Work. It is our pleasure to commend Jose today uh, and we have a commendation signed by our entire council and our mayor. Congratulations and thank you. <laughs> Secretary of La Raza Historical Society, and uh, I was asked to introduce Jose because I'm the oldest student of his that they could find. <laughs> I came to San Jose State in 1969 to attend the, uh, Me the Mexican American Graduate Studies Program, the first Chicano Studies Program master's degree in the United States started right here, yes. and it was started by that man. And 1969 was 
not the start of things we all know, you know. We all stand on shoulders of people and people and people. <coughs> and I wouldn't name anybody in here because I'll miss all the important people that are all part of what this room is today. Uh, that program started in 69, but it wasn't started by the university. It was started by the efforts of the Chicano people of this town. In 52, the, the locals formed the CSO. They organized a whole lot of people, trained a whole lot of people. One was a kid, Cesar Chavez. In 62, Chavez left San Jose, had another vision, went to the land. In 64, Jose Carrasco, who grew up, uh, uh, where's the chief? Uh, he, he grew up uh, running away from the cops in Santa Clara. <laughs> <laughs> but he had a burning passion to help people, so he, uh, went to work for the United Council of Churches uh, here in, in the valley, and that United Council of Churches was sending blankets, food, money, whatever they could, to Cesar in Delano. So one day I went home and I, uh, like, like I said, I'm going to talk with my dad. My father was involved back in the 1940s, uh, in the early days, with uh, all of the stuff that was happening. The police department, of course, was one of the major, major forces that used to really uh, enjoy uh, you know, you know the Chicanela, the Raza, uh, you, you know, on the streets and other places. We, I, you know, I guess I spent uh, not quite as much time in the juvenile hall as I did in high school or at, well, junior high and high school. But uh, you know, I had my share. Uh, my my father w would kind of listen to me while I was reading the newspaper, and I always knew when I was saying something profound because he'd put his newspaper down and look at me and say, Jose, I can tell you went to school for a long, long time because no one could be naturally that dumb. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, so I've always carried that with me because, you know, a lot of ways what he said was very true. The, the more educated we become sometimes, the dumber we are. And, and, and one of the things that happens is that, is that it's been the involvement with the community, communities, uh, that, that, that has made it possible to keep from becoming as dumb as otherwise I might have gotten. And, and um, it, was, it, was, it was raised in Santa Clara. Uh, uh, my family comes out of a little Polonia in Fort Morgan, Colorado, and, and uh, came into Santa Clara back around 1942, 43, uh, was raised there. And, and uh, you know, while there was always the racism and the bigotry in the schools especially, those were the days when our school teachers were still the old, what they call missionary, uh, missionary, uh, what was the rule of word, uh, uh, Rudy, for, you know, never married. They weren't married, they were all mistresses and, and uh, very Protestant. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, learned quickly, went in, Jose came out, Joe. Uh, and Joe stuck with me all the way through my army records, military, everything else. My records are still Joe. In fact, they were expanded to Joseph. So I figure somehow or other I'm getting closer to the majority. Uh, but but uh, I was raised with a lot of different folks. And the beauty of it is that they were all first generation, like myself, my family, my you know my brothers and sisters, and and so. Uh, you know, I was raised with Portuguese, Italian, Spaniards, who often the older folks didn't care for us, but the young, you know, the young kids our age, you, you know, we, we, we grew up together, we played together, we went to school together, played sports together later. And so Chicano for me was never something about color. It was never something about race and about language alone. It, it was more of a philosophy. It was more of a way, a different way to look at the world and what was in front of us and to better understand why, why we were going to do this or why we did this and all of those kind of things. Something that we could maybe take into the future instead of just leaving it behind in the past. So, spent a lot of time looking backwards. A lot of the activity that I was involved with, many of you in this room 
someone was talking about the teachers and the walkouts. Our efforts to organize Chicano teachers, Rudy Cordova here, was one of the bedrocks that I was able to lean on when I uh, uh, got tired or confused. Uh, Miss Esparza, uh, her father and mother were central uh, in, in, in forging and, and moving uh, Chicano education from from not only the high schools, but also from community colleges into the University of San Jose and, and fought battles, uh, you know, right along with all of us. Uh, uh, like someone said, she was about that old the last time I remember seeing her. So it's good to see you again. Uh, the uh, Tony Estremera, the first time I met him was back around 1964. 65, I was organizing with the Council of Churches. For those of you who don't know the Council of Churches, that was a name that the Protestant, the mainline Protestant churches used to use when they formed what they called an association called uh, Council of Churches. In Northern California, Santa Clara County, they were, they were the first ones to hire organizers to try to begin working in our neighborhoods and communities. And as part of that, I, I bumped into folks in the east side who were starting an organization called United People Arriba, Sofia Mendoza, Jack Brito, and some others. And, and uh, one of the main questions that was being raised at that time was schools were starting to talk about busing. And there was a busing in the east side schools where they started taking our junior high, high school kids to other districts, other places, uh, busing and so on. And one of the early uh, 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 beneficiaries of this thing was Tony Estemera. And, and, and he was, uh, what were you about? Uh, a, 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 you were about a sophomore. Sophomore. And Tony, Tony uh, <coughs> refused to, to go. And, and, and he started uh, arguing with his teachers. And, and so United People Arriba got behind him. And, other, and then other students started to say the same thing. And then they started pushing to get our schools locally, you know, with the kind of resources that they needed to have to, uh, to, to you know, begin. Uh, you know, rebuilding our own communities. So, Pleasure seeing all of you again. Uh, I'm flattered. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, what? You know, I, you know, I feel like my dad says dumb. You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm truly amazed at, at what you've accomplished here. Uh, I guess I've been gone about. Maybe seven. <coughs> yeah, I guess it's been about 17 years since we left here. Uh, came back periodically, but only to see my sisters. Uh, kind of made an effort not to, you know, visit too many people because, you know, I found out that, you know, when I, you know, knowing all of you that I know and knowing all of you, and I won't forget your faces for sure and your names, but that I. You know, learn never to accept or, or to avoid someone that's active because the first thing that I'm going to be given is invited to go to a meeting. And, and uh, an, old, an old friend and, and, and uh, mentor back when in the 19, the same time I was uh, at the Council of Churches, I bumped into Anissa Velarza and worked with him. In, in, in putting together the health clinic in, in, in Aviso and stuff. And uh, uh, I, I invited him to a meeting one time, and he said, no, thank you. When I asked him, well, is that reason? He says, yeah. He says, yeah, Jose. He says, you know, I, I, I learned back when that, 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 that uh, you know, when you go to one meeting, 
there's always the next. And so, uh, you know, it took me a long time to learn that, but I began to learn, you know, stay away from the invitations. Uh, I, I, I'd like to just maybe uh, to try to share something with you. One of the things that sort of uh, caught me is, 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 is it okay if I walk around a little bit? Do I have to be here? Uh, uh, I, I, I learned, one of the things that excited me about education, uh, I, I uh, came back from the military, uh, A lot of folks lost, and I bumped into. I I, I spent a lot of time in the bars, you know. And I spent a lot of time in the bars, and and for a long time I started feeling guilty about that, you know. Uh, until one day I was about a senior, a junior, and you know, at San Jose State, and I took a course in philosophy, and I read a guy named named Nietzsche, Nietzsche. Uh, and, and, and he had a book that I'm reading, and, and he says, you know, he says, the problem with our society is that we have the wrong people in the bars and the wrong people in the libraries. He said, the, the scholar belongs in the bar and the drunkard in the library. And when I read that, I knew I had been in the right place. <laughs> The, 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 the thing that happened is I'm reading, I, I start getting into Greek mythology. And, and I start reading some of the early stuff about the early Greek, the Greek gods and the birth of the Greek gods. And, and uh, uh, I, 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 I used to try to teach my students at Roosevelt uh, uh, some of this stuff. Uh, and, and, and the teachers uh, in the English department, I was an English teacher, I was the first English teacher in Northern California, you know, Chicano. And, and, uh, uh, so, so I'm trying to teach them this stuff about a little bit of Shakespeare and stuff here. And so they keep telling me, look, just, 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 you know, forget the novels, forget books, forget everything. Just teach them how to fill out a job application and, 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 and show movies and step on them until Christmas. And then everything smooths out. But I started teaching them something about the Greek gods, you know, and, and the first Greek gods that were born were this huge, monstrous, you know, uh, 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 creatures called the Hecatocrians, and they were, well, you know, 100 arms and heads, and, and, so, and so the Papa, you know, the Father Heaven, by the way, Father Heaven and Mother Earth were very central to the Greek mind in the Greek world. Uh, the Father Heaven was, of course, Father Sky, Uranus, and, and you know, I used that word one time doing a training, and somebody says, yours. Uh, 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 so anyway, so then, of course, Mother Earth was Gia, and so, so long story short, Father Sky and Mother Earth see each other, you know, and they do whatever, and, and the next thing you know, you got these first Greek gods born, and these monsters, and so Father Sky took one look at them, got scared, and so he put them into Hades. And of course, Hades at that time was sort of a, a mythical place where it was just called the underworld. There was no hell, no heaven, just the underworld. <coughs> he had them placed there, you know, chains, and, 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 and kept them down there because he didn't want any, any, any problems, and somewhere along the line, he had heard that one of his children, somewhere along the line, would undo him and take his place, so he made sure that these folks weren't going to get around. Well, the second batch was just a, not quite as bad, but they were also huge, and they had that one eye, the Cyclops. So he looked at them, and he says, oh, boy, Johnny, con esto, let's put them downstairs. <laughs> so he put them down there, and then finally he came out with this beautiful, group of, of gods, and, and, and they were just beautiful. They looked just like him, Chicanos, you know, just brown and beautiful. And so, and so he, 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 he loved these, and so they're called the Titans. So if you've ever read cartoons and, and, and magazines, the old cartoon magazine stuff or watch, that's, that's, that's where they're coming from. So the Titans 
are just sort of sort of this big beautiful gods moving around just going around I don't know if any of any of you ever remember on TV this guy used to be called uh, <coughs> tip throw to the tulips through the tulips he used to play a little little banjo tiny Tim <coughs> was it tiny Tim tiny Tim yeah plays it well the, you know that's what they did they just tiptoed through the tulips and that's all they did and then of course Here's where the trouble starts, always starts. La mama. Huh? Well, Mother Earth, you know, in Spanish and in Mexican lore, like there is true with almost all cultures that, that say Mexican, La Llorona. You know, the mythical mother who cries for her children and what's happened to her children. And Well, you know, Mother Earth is the typical, she was the first Llorona. And so she's crying for her kids, crying for her kids. And she keeps on trying to ask, you know, Father Sky, can we let him out? No, no, hey, leave him right where they are. So finally, she finally tries to go to every one of her children, the Titan gods, to see if maybe one of them will help her to, to free her kids. So they all refuse except for the very last one, Cronus. Cronus, uh, who finally agrees to help her. And so they make this little deal where, uh, where, where they're going to get the father's guy's going to come in, who used to visit every evening, you know, bringing him the cloak of night and just sort of. And so he finally gets there, and the plot is that Cronus is going to hide behind the doors and stuff when he comes in, and then he's going to. Of course, he'll be lured first by Mother Earth because they put together a love potion number nine, and and, and so. That happens, and once that takes place, then here comes Cronus, and he smacks his old man in the head, and they take care of that and get rid of him, and then Cronus becomes the big king. And he leaves all of his brothers and sisters to just sort of wander around and be like Tiny Tim, just playing with their stuff and just enjoying life. Uh, no one ever gets in trouble if they do, he simply hits them in the head. And, so nothing happens, you see, nothing ever takes place. But what happens down the line, Cronus gets married, of course, he marries his younger sister, Hera, and then not Hera, but uh, uh, anyway, another mama. So he marries his younger sister, and they have children, and of course, Cronus gets the same message that his old man had. One of these days, one of your children is going to you know, do you in and then take your place. So if you ever get an idea for all these medieval stories about the king and about the ones who destroy the king and then they go after destroying all the kids, that's where many of these notions come from. But anyway, in this case, Cronus and his wife give birth to a whole new set of kings or gods, gods and goddesses. And the same thing happens. Cronus has been told, hey, you know, something's going to happen down there. So what he does, he, everyone that's born, every one of his children that's born, he swallows them, swallows them whole. And uh, so he becomes known as Father Time, you know. Cronus in Greek had the term about the passing of time. And time swallows everything, right? So that's what he's doing being true to himself. Finally, of course, as he's doing this, his wife is the second Yorona. She's crying for her kids and her kids, and then, of course, you got Grandma back here crying about her kids, and everybody's crying, and I think I'm crying. And so, let me just... Uh, I want to know that's just old age. <laughs> no, I, 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 I've been asking about folks, so and so and so and so, and I keep being told, you know, you know they passed away. Uh, so it's really great to see some of you who are still around. I guess. Uh, anyway, Cronus finally swallows all of them, and so when the young, when the last god is born, his wife, Gia, takes a rock, puts a blanket on it, gives it to Cronus, Cronus swallows that, and in the meantime they take 
Zeus, who has just been born, and they take and they and they uh, huddle them off to an island called Crete. <sighs> they take them off to Crete, and uh, so in the meantime, you know, the two mothers, the mother and the grandmother, just keep crying. And uh, so finally, finally Zeus is getting to a point where he's full-grown muscle. You know, he's, he, he, you know, he looks like some of you folks. Uh, anyway, he's just big and handsome. And, 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 and of course, all of the gods and goddesses, Cronus, they're still there. Well, so the mother goes and talks to Zeus, tells him what the father did swallowing all his brothers and sisters and so he agrees to help the mother and he agrees because he knows that if, he, if she hadn't put that rock at, you know given the rock to his father and his father swallowed the rock he would have been one of those who was gone so he they come up with their own kind of plot again here again go back to the love potion number nine except in this case they put a what is that thing for kind of uh, making people vomit up things. So that's what they gave him. And, and, and all this, so when he's unconscious, vomiting, he just vomits up all of his sister, you know, all of his children. And they all come out full grown, beautiful gods and goddesses. And, 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 uh, uh, and then, then uh, you know, Zeus, uh, uh, you know, is able to get him tied up, and they get rid of him. And in the meantime, then you've got the, the, you know, his brothers and sisters are back in. They get the full story about what happened to them, and then what happened to their uncles and aunts of way back when, because grandma's now in the picture. And and uh, I'm talking too long. <laughs> Let me bring it short. So there's a big battle. Because the old guards, the old gods now want to take over again, and the young gods are saying no, hey. So there's a big battle, and eventually, with the help of all the monsters that were down in Hades, uh, the agreement that Zeus makes with his grandmother, they get them out, and the, you know these guys help them, and they win the war. Now the problem is, how do we keep peace? You see, because. Uh, now these are all gods and all goddesses, and, and as you know, there isn't a, there isn't a person who chairs or who's president of an organization who is not a jealous god. And uh, you know, when you're doing something, you don't want anybody else to come over and say, "Hey, join us in doing this and doing that," because you're busy doing what you're doing. Well, that's how the Greek gods were. So what Zeus does is he goes and he talks to every one of his brothers and sisters. He figures out what they like and what they want to do, and then he gives each one of them the rule over, for example, his brother uh, Poseidon. He gives ownership of the oceans and the waters, and he becomes the god of the waters. His sister, uh, uh, his sister uh, uh, Demeter, uh, she loves to plant things and make things beautiful, so he makes her goddess of nature. And then you guess so he does this with every one of his brothers and sisters. And so they rule from there, they rule forever, because every one of them who's good at doing something and is given total control over that rule, no one can interfere with them without their permission. They have to give agreement. But because they're able, every one of them was given something, and they had a task that they were good at. They survived for hundreds, thousands of years before they were finally put out of people's minds. The reason I'm going through all of this is because you've accomplished something that we talked about forever and ever, but we're never able to do. The effort that we had coming when we tried to put together the Confederación de la Raza Unida, we got the idea here, but it was never allowed to move into what we hope to envision. 
that someday we would have organizations that were good at what they did. And so if there was a political concern, then MAPA would take care of that, and MAPA would be the one, and if they needed help, we would help them. If there was something dealing with, with the need for jobs, then the employment committees, whatever they were, those who were good at that would deal with that, and if they needed help, we would help them. If somebody was on education, then we would let those organizations dealing with education take it on, and we would help so that everyone could grow. Instead of having one person or one little group doing everything, we never quite reached that point. But when I came back and, I, and I'm hearing things and I'm saying things, Victor, uh, you know, all I can say is congratulations to you and all the rest of you because this is, this is far beyond what I would have thought I would have been able to see. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. second when you were talking about all those gods, but then at the end I, I finally understood that you were talking about everyone in this room. And, and, and you're right, each one of them in this room have a different role to play in our community and the only reason we get together is so that we can support each other and help each other. And that's the only way we're going to be moving forward. Earlier, uh, I think it was uh, one thing. Uh, Rose and, and uh, a couple other people and myself uh, met with uh, Maya. And we were talking about also the issue uh, of uh, the Planning Commission uh, having all white. You see, we're still fighting the battle of racism. And there was six to five the vote in favor of keeping it white versus having one Latina or Latino in the planning commission. We have five city council members that happen to be Hispanic, Latino, Latina. They call it Latinx now, something new for me. But yet they were not successful. But Maya did come up with some uh, uh, great recommendation, may I share it? Her recommendation is, and they have to go through a charter amendment in the city, is for each city council member to have a representative in that planning commission and possibly in every other commission as well. That's an excellent idea because now we can't blame no one if we don't have people of color in those commissioners because if we do have city council members of people of color, and they don't appoint people of color to the commission, then it's they are the problem. They are the problem. But this way, we have an opportunity to correct the problem. Right now, they have, I think, seven, five? five? Seven. Seven members of the planning commission, all of them are white. Yes. Okay? In today's society, I've been fighting battles here along with Dr. Jose Carrasco and many of you. Richard Santos, Tony Tremera, Paul Guerrero, Rosa Amador, Pete Carrillo, others. For almost 50 years, fighting racism and discrimination, blatant racism. The unions were the worst enemies we had. I'm happy to say that many of the unions now have a major reflection of the community that we serve, or they serve. And that's great, I'm proud of them. We still have a long way to go, you can see. You have six people in the city council, five more, and a mayor voting not to have a Latino or Latina on the planning commission. That's an insult to our people in our community. We should not stay silent. We should make sure that they get letters from us or phone calls and making them aware that we're not happy with what took place. And that we want changes to occur. 
that would have a reflection of the whole community on that planning commission. I want to adjourn this meeting in memory of two great people, Sherry Labo, which is Rose Amador's mother-in-law, passed away recently. We also have a person that many of you knew and know, Judge Ter Teresa Guerrero Daly. A dear friend, she passed away recently from cancer. Okay? A friend that I had the honor and pleasure and privilege of working with for many years. She was our first independent police auditor, and I served with her in that position there, helping her with the advisory board that she created for many, many years. She went on to become a judge, and she was always here supporting Conexión and supporting La Raza Ronde. Those are the kind of people we need. If we lose one, we should bring in two or three. But it takes an effort from all of you and, and us together to do that. I find my friend Enrique Flores, and I call him a cholo friend. He started coming to the restaurant table, and he was a cholo. And he used to wear his pants like a cholo and dress like a cholo. But one of the things that made me be very proud of, he was a gang member, and he moved out of the gang. He went and got educated. He went to Santa Clara University and got his uh, bachelor's degree, and then went on and got his master's degree. He has written two books about his life, and the story about his life of being a cholo, being a member of gangs, and how he managed to get out of it. We have many role models if we were to look around. Enrique happened to be one that I love him dearly, because he always shows up at La Raza Round Table. He's always willing to help us. All I have to do is place a phone call to him, and he will tell me whether he can do it or not. And he works at it. We need more people like Enrique in the city council. We need more people in the county board of supervisors. We need more people in the school districts. I just had a major meeting Wednesday with many superintendents and school board of trustees. 1972-1974, Dr. Carrasco led two marches from here, organized two marches, 125 miles we walked, marched all the way to Sacramento. Ramon was part of that. Rosa Maduro was part of that. I can't see anyone else in here that was part of that march right now, and you may be in here, but I don't see him. He organized two marches, 1972 and 1974. Oh, Hakes up there was one of the guys that was on that march as well. He told me, raise your hand, Hakes. <laughs> Don't be afraid, raise your hand, be proud. <laughs> no, and what were we fighting for, what are we fighting today? We want better education for our kids. We want more money invested in education. In the 60s, when Governor Pat Brown was the governor, we were number one in the country. Today, we're number 48, 49 in the country. That is embarrassing. We need to continue to work with our legislators and tell them that is not acceptable. We need to invest more money in education. Our future lays out there in the community, not in the jails. We have many of those already in the jails. We want to get them out and educate them. We want them to have an opportunity to be like you and me. To help us, please, continue to attend our meetings. It's extremely important because people are not going to come here. Dr. Carrasco is not going to come here to look at Rose and me. He come here because of you, because of all of you. The speakers that we have here, they come here because of you. They don't come because of me. And they don't come because of Rose or Tony Tremera. They come because of all of you. You guys are the power. You guys are the influence. You guys are the ones that make this organization what it is today. La Raza Roundtable is what you make it, not what I make it, what we make it and all of you together. Okay. Thank you very much.
Hi, my name is Lupe Lujan Montes de Oca, and the reason that I'm here attending uh, uh, here at Conexión um, is to come and listen to um, Dr. Jose Carrasco, and um, I uh, I've always admired uh, Dr. Carrasco um, as uh, being one of the first Chicanos to. Uh, uh, you know, really fight for uh, us uh, to get um, better education uh, and um, all kinds of stuff. Oh my goodness! Um, and uh, also that I'm here is because uh, I learned the uh, philosophy uh, on um, community organizing uh, at, at a Pico training that I attended. Um, and he, uh, he was there uh, talking about the philosophy of how to organize the community and what it takes to uh, do that. So I graduated in, uh, from San Jose State in 1982 uh, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in the Fine Arts. And um, I'm, I'm an artist. Um, and. Um, I'm also a programmer at KKUP. And I'm Gregorio Mora Torres. I'm a professor in Mexican American Studies, Chicano Studies now, uh, San Jose State. And uh, just, uh, I'm very happy to be here with Dr. Uh, Jose Carrasco, uh, the guy who hired me at San Jose State, uh, who spoke yesterday at San, at San Jose State. And, uh, and, and I was impressed by his knowledge and his memory and his philosophy. I always knew he, had, he was a philosopher, but I heard he used to really well. And it reminded me of his time when he was here teaching us, and, uh, and obviously when he was my, uh, my patron. Okay, I'm Jose Carrasco, and uh, this is my uh, professor, Mora Torres, who, who, when he came to talk about being hired, uh, he says that I wanted him to work for nothing. <laughs> 
You know, I'm not sure if I remember that, but but if that's true, then I was a hell of a lot smarter than <laughs> I thought I was, uh, having succeeded in getting him to work. But he he was my last my last colleague, my last colleague uh, after 37 years uh, at San Jose State. Uh, uh, he he's what kept it from being just a lonely desert, and, and so for that I appreciate everything that. Uh, that you know, I, you know, I've been able to remember and think of him. <laughs> I'm Ramon Martinez, and I'm giving testimony that your uh, gamble paid off. This is the soul of Chicano studies at San Jose State today. Well, he sure is. He, you know, he's he's starting to show show the the, the strain of it, but 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 he's got the stamina, so that's good. Hopefully, uh, you know, it's going to keep on going. Well, at least for another couple of years, no? <laughs> yes, at least a couple more years when he can leave with a good, solid retirement. Me llamo Maria Eugenia Ramos Fuentes. I'm here because, well, I'm here for the, to be here for the last roundtable meeting to connect with, with everyone and to see my professor, Jose Carrasco, again. Hey, my name is Yolanda Guerra, and I'm from San Jose. I was born and raised in San Jose. I'm a high school teacher. I teach at the second oldest high school in California, which is San Jose High. I'm very proud of that. I also went to San Jose High. Um, and I came for a lot of different reasons, uh, mainly for my, I'm also an artist, y'all, to say that. Um, I teach art at San Jose High. But I came um, because, as always, we all need to be edu educated and understand where we came from and where, you know, where, who are the people who brought us to where we are today. And I come from on the backs of many people, um, including my brothers and sisters and the people in the community. And um, so I came just to uh, hear Dr. Carrasco and um, be a part of and continue and hopefully to continue to be a part of. Uh, this community, and uh, not just for myself, but for my students, and uh, and also for educating myself when I produce my artwork as well. So uh, it's, it was a really lovely evening. And, uh, Hi, Frank, Frank Espinosa, I'm, a, I'm a, the nephew of Jose Carrasco, and uh, I've been asked a question regarding the pilgrimage from San Jose to Sacramento from 71 to, to 1974 and you know, major contributions that that were that resulted from that march we're all benefiting from and I've, I've, I've heard of the uh, you know, the challenges the struggles that, that took place during that march which was uh, you know from San, San Jose to Sacramento but one of the things that I oftentimes find uh, that's missing is uh, the behind the scenes uh, uh, work that that had to happen in order for that march to, to be successful and when I talk about behind the scenes I'm talking about uh, uh, the feeding of the marchers and uh, what's what's not told is the story about the uh, the women uh, who tirelessly uh, had to cook up a storm uh, during during that march to make sure that the marchers were fed uh, making sure that 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 food was ran up to uh, the marchers you know, whether whether it was in, you know, uh, Stockton or Modesto or wherever it was, but um, you know, it, there's a lot that needs to be told about about the the women behind the scenes who at that time were were contributing to the success of that march, and I think uh, there, there needs to be more research done on this area. And, and, and the research could begin with uh, some, some of our own moms or, or some of the women in our own neighborhoods uh, uh, and their contributions. Professor Espinosa, would you give me some of the names of the women that did that work? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, so some of them have passed on, but one of them would, would of course, would be the, the mother of, of Dr. Jose Carrasco, uh, my grandmother, uh, Maximina uh, Carrasco, uh, as well as the sister. Uh, of Dr. Carrasco, uh, uh, Susana uh, Loya, my mother Mary Espinosa, 
and, and, and other women that I'm sure were involved. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I can only identify those women because they were my immediate family members that I watched as a young boy uh, working up a storm, cooking up the food, and making sure that they were getting the, the opportunity to, to, to benefit from a lot of the efforts uh, that the march and, 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 and other significant events uh, provided for people like my, young people like myself or at one time young people like myself were able to benefit from to be able to go to graduate school uh, so that I could eventually pursue a doctorate and, and today be uh, Dr. Frank Espinosa faculty member at Evergreen Valley College and a member of the Enlace Coordinating Committee.